Hello everyone, today we are breaking down Season 1, Episode 3, Long, Long Time of The Last of Us. But before that, remember to like the video, helps out the channel a lot, and subscribe, and yada yada yada, let's get to it. The first thing we see is Joel grabbing rocks out of a stream and making a little shrine. I would assume this is to honor Tess, who died last episode after blowing up with the rest of the infected. Joel then returns to base camp, where we find Ellie, who is just waking up. The group is about 10 miles out of Boston. They are heading to Bill and Frank's, who were Joel and Tess's smuggling partners, in hopes of a car battery. But as of right now, they are forced to make the journey on foot, which is time-consuming and dangerous. Ellie tries to make small talk with Joel, but he seems to ignore her. Ellie then brings up the subject of Tess, which kind of makes Joel a little mad. Ellie says that nobody made Tess and Joel go along with this plan. They wanted a battery, and they made a choice, so don't blame her for that choice. So Ellie is saying, I didn't make you guys do anything. You guys chose to do this, you knew the risk, don't be mad at me. Joel shakes his head in acknowledgement, but he probably still slightly blames her for this. Joel then says they have a five hour hike to Bill and Frank's, so their journey is not over just yet. The two start walking, Joel is very vigilant as they walk, Ellie wants to know why. Joel is looking for people, infected are dumb, they aren't really going to sneak up on you, but people definitely would, especially since they aren't in a big group, it's just the two of them making them an easy target. The two stop by an abandoned gas station. Joel says he has to grab some things he stashed here. Joel then tells Ellie that they hide supplies on routes in case they ever find themselves short on gear, which they are currently. They enter the building and Joel starts looking around for where he stashed his gear. The way Joel made it sound that this is a common thing for him and Tess to do. So it's understandable that he may not remember where he put it at this particular gas station. Ellie decides to explore the rest of the gas station while Joel looks for the gear. She finds an entrance to the cellar which was hidden. She heads down. She finds a box of tampons, which to be honest is quite the find. While she's down there, she finds a stalker trapped in some rubble. A stalker is the second stage of infection. It is those who have been infected for at least two weeks. At this stage, they look a lot less human with fungal growth around their eyes. And sometimes the fungus can break through the skull, which we see here. Ellie goes up to the creature and starts cutting it with her knife. This is probably the closest she has ever gone to one that couldn't attack her. So she's doing some tests. She puts it out of its misery, stabbing it in the head. We return to Joel, he found a stash, it was under the floorboards, which is smart, most people aren't going to look there. Remember, Joel did construction before the outbreak, so he understands joist spacing and floorboards a bit better than the average person. He knows of places where he can hide things that people aren't going to look for. Ellie returns from below. Joel is stashing the AR he got from the Federa soldier in the first episode. Ellie wants to know why. Joel explains that there isn't much ammo out there for this thing, so it's basically useless. In the Last of Us world, ammo is scarce. They don't have infinite ammo like other zombie shows out there. Carrying an AR around is just extra weight. Might as well leave it here until a purpose arises for it. The two continue walking. They talk about the virus and how it spread. Joel tells Ellie the theory he has heard over the years, that the cordyceps virus mutated and got into the food supply, got into something basic like flour, and then those brands of food that use flour were sold around the world. Things like bread, cereal, and pancake mix. Now him mentioning pancake mix is important. It was what Sarah, his daughter, was going to make him for his birthday right before the outbreak. So Joel was nearly infected that day, but luckily they didn't have the pancake mix, so he was safe. He explains if people ate enough of the tainted food, they would get sick and then would start biting. And then you have a global pandemic on your hands. Joel wants to cut across the field. He does not want Ellie to see what is ahead. Ellie, of course, now has to see what's ahead. They walk and see a bunch of charred bones. Joel explains that the government was evacuating the small towns in the area and told them they were going to the QZ if there was room. If there wasn't room, they were going to be then shot and burned, which, of course, they didn't know that was an option when they got on the truck. Ellie asked why they just didn't leave them alone. And Joel says that dead people can't turn and spread the virus. So yes, it was a very crappy thing for the government to do, but in their mind, it was for the greater good. 
In the next scene, we have a flashback to 2003, about four days after the initial outbreak. The government is evacuating a small town. The people who got on this truck are the ones we saw in the bone pile. We are first introduced to Bill here. He has cameras on the outside of his house and is monitoring everything that is happening from his bunker. Bill is one of those doomsday preppers, so he's very prepared for a scenario like this. Federa is requiring everyone to leave the area. That is why Bill is in his bunker hiding. He has no trust for the government and will not be going to a QZ. He has his own plan for the apocalypse. After Federa leaves, Bill turns the lights on and we see that his bunker is full of guns and ammo. So he's already in a pretty good situation. He heads up and we find out that the entrance to his bunker was concealed, which is why Federa wasn't able to find him when they searched his home. After Bill makes sure the ghost is clear, we see him give a cheeky little smile. This is basically Bill's dream scenario. No more following government rule, no more pointless jobs, just living off the land and surviving. Bill goes on a bit of a supply gathering spree. First grabbing gasoline and putting it in 50 gallon drums. He, wanted to make, he wants to make sure everything he needs is accessible from his main area and the gas station will not be part of his base. He then hits the Home Depot real quick, picks up a bunch of different supplies, galvanized fencing, 2x4s, and wire. Now, I would think the Home Depot would have been pretty well looted at this point, but I guess not. Bill has a plan of how he wants to set up his base. Now, all he has to do is do it. We then see he has a generator in the back of his house, so he's going to live with electricity, so compared to some, he will be living in luxury. We then get a montage of him setting up his base, so setting up the booby traps around it and the fence. The booby traps are going to be used to keep infected and regular people out. When people see this place, some will most likely try and take it, and Bill will be prepared for those raiders. We then see how he's going to get his food. He has chickens and a vegetable garden. He seems to be butchering an animal here. Maybe this was a deer he shot. I can't really tell, but I don't think it's an animal that he is raising. We then see Bill eat a pretty gourmet meal. He even has wine. Once again, living the life of luxury. He's probably living better now than before the pandemic, to be honest. We then see that Bill has motion sensors all around the perimeter of his base. It goes off and Bill goes to the cameras and sees an infected heading his way. But the infected gets taken out by one of his traps and dies immediately. We do another time jump. It is now 2007. We see Bill has an electronic code on the entrances to the town. He doesn't even have to get out of his car to do it, which I think is pretty fancy. He seems to have made another Home Depot run. He has a bunch of supplies in the back of his truck and boat. Once again, I think Home Depot at this point would have been looted, especially after another four years, but apparently not. Bill is in his bunker when his motion sensor goes off. It seems that one of his traps was sprung again, but this one is just a big hole. So he will have to go outside and finish whatever was caught. Bill heads out and we hear a voice from the hole saying, I'm not infected. Bill realizes it's a person and he starts to look to the tree line, worrying there could be more people and that this was a trap. The man is just trying to get to the Boston QZ. He was at the Baltimore QZ, but it was destroyed. The man in the hole is Frank, which we know becomes Bill's partner. This is how the two first meet. Bill gets a ladder for Frank to get out, and he tells Frank which way Boston is and tells him to go. So we see Bill isn't a monster. A monster would have shot him there and now. Bill just wants to be left alone. Frank convinces Bill to give him some food. First, he hits Bill with those doughy eyes. Bill brings him in. Frank even gets to take a hot shower. Which, once again, Bill is living pretty good compared to the most of the world. Frank can't believe he has hot water. We also see Bill act very strange around Frank. Most likely because he hasn't been around another human in years, or maybe it's something else. Bill brings out dinner. Frank is in amazement, like he can't believe what he is seeing. This looks like the kind of food people would eat before the outbreak, not now. Bill even breaks out a bottle of wine. Frank says a man who knows to pair rabbit with a Beaujolais, which is wine. So apparently Bill and Frank know about wine and fine dining. So they got some stuff in common. I think there's a part of Bill who enjoys the company because humans, even introverts, need the human connection every once in a while. Without it, you kind of start to go crazy. Frank is about to leave, but he wants to play the piano first. 
he finds a song that he likes. It's called Long, Long Time, which I got to be honest, I've been listening to that song on repeat since seeing it in this episode. It's an awesome song. Also, I love this scene. I'm a sucker for pianos. Frank starts playing it, but isn't great at it. Bill tells him to stop, not this song. Frank kind of figures out that this song means something special to Bill. And Frank tells him that he will go after Bill plays it for him. Bill plays it beautifully, a real tearjerker. Frank asks who the girl was. Bill says there isn't one. And then Frank leans in for a kiss. Bill's a little scared at first. He's a little hesitant. This is the first time him being with a man. But he does embrace it. He has always been gay, but has never felt comfortable enough to let it out. The two continue in the bedroom and have the sex. We get another time jump and it is now three years later. So Bill and Frank are together together now. They're having a bit of an argument. Frank wants to spruce up the place, paint the house and mow the lawn. And Bill thinks that is dumb, which I agree. There are more pressing matters than appearances. Frank then drops a bombshell on Bill saying that they are going to have friends here. It turns out Frank has been communicating with somebody on the radio and he wants to invite them over. And he does. Those friends turn out to be Tess and Joel. You could tell that they are younger, their hair hasn't grayed yet, like in the current timeline. And we find out that Tess and Joel have been together a long time, at least 10 to 13 years. Joel's probably struggling internally with her death. He's shoving those feelings down inside. He doesn't have time to grieve is the problem. He has to make sure he and Ellie survive their trip. At the dinner, Bill has a gun on the table. He does not trust either of these strangers. The dinner is about working together. So this is where they discuss smuggling goods in and out. Tess and Frank leave and Joel and Bill discuss business. Joel says there are things they can help each other with. The QZ has machine parts, medicine, books. Their partnership would benefit both sides. Tess and Joel head out before they do. Joel tells Bill that there will be raiders who will come for this place. They will be armed and they will come at night. Bill says they'll be fine. This place is like paradise compared to most of the world. Of course, people will want to take it. But Bill is confident in his traps and his abilities that nobody will be able to. Another three years pass, the two are jogging together. Frank has something special to show Bill, and he brings him to the garden. Frank traded a gun with Tess for some strawberry seeds, and Bill is delighted. They both eat one and just start laughing. It probably brings them some happy memories before the outbreak. Bill tells Frank he was never afraid until he showed up. Bill was saying that nothing scared him beforehand, but once Frank came into his life, he found something he didn't want to lose, that he didn't want to leave behind. His decisions have Frank in mind now. It is now night and raining. A group of raiders try to get into the town. The defenses start kicking in. Remember, Bill has this place booby-trapped. He has flamethrowers on the fence, so you really can't get near it. It is also electrified. So it's just really hard to get in. Frank is still sleeping when the crap hits the fan. He heads outside. Bill is already out there shooting at the raiders with a hunting rifle. Frank kind of distracts Bill, causing him to turn around. Bill then gets shot. Frank helps him into the house. Bill was shot in the belly. Frank gets the first aid kit. Bill thinks he's going to die from this and tells Frank to call Joel that he will take care of him. So Bill doesn't believe Frank could survive here on his own, that he doesn't have the killer instinct like him and Joel. Bill just wants to make sure Frank lives on even after he passes. He wants to make sure that he will be okay. We have another time jump. It is 10 years later. So we are now in the current timeline. We see that Frank is not doing so hot. He is in a wheelchair. It is not said what he has, but people on the internet think it's Parkinson's disease. Usually that causes shaking and many people have difficulty walking. We see Frank has become a bit of a painter. He really can't leave the house that easily anymore, so he found some hobbies to kill time with. We see that Frank can't even have normal food anymore. He has to eat like a soup pudding thing. Also has to take a boatload of pills. So his quality of life isn't exactly ideal. Bill wakes up the next morning to find Frank in his chair. Frank tells Bill that this is going to be his last day. Bill is devastated by this news. Frank just wants one more good day. He wants to get married, get dressed up, have a great meal, and then at the end of the night, he wants Bill to put all this pain medication in his wine. Then Frank wants to die in Bill's arms. Rather a romantic way to go. 
Bill brings out the meal. It is the same meal they ate together when they first met, Rabbit. And of course, he is pairing it with the same wine. Frank gives a smile, remembering all those years ago. Bill brings out another bottle of wine. He crushes up the pills and puts it in Frank's glass. We then find out he also put enough pills in the bottle to kill a horse as well. So Bill has decided that he would rather die than live in a world without Frank, that he was his purpose. Frank isn't too happy about this, but admits it's incredibly romantic. Bill takes Frank to bed, and they die in each other's arms. Joel and Ellie arrive at Bill and Frank's compound. Joel thinks something bad has happened. The flowers look like they haven't been watered in some time. They enter the house, and Ellie finds the suicide note. She reads it to Joel. Bill tells Joel in the letter that all his gear is now his. Use it to protect Tess. Joel crumbles up the letter. We see that he starts to let some of those emotions out. He failed to protect Tess. He takes some of the responsibility for her death. He also failed to protect Sarah. Will he be able to protect Ellie? He heads to the garage and puts the car battery together and puts it on the charger. He tells Ellie that he's going to Wyoming to find his brother Tommy. She's welcome to come along, but she has to do what he says when he says it. Tommy also used to be a firefly, so he may know where this firefly base is located at that Ellie needs to go to. Ellie agrees to Joel's terms. The two then start gathering supplies for their journey. We see Ellie get a new shirt. This is the shirt she wears in the games, so this is a bit of an Easter egg for people who play the games. Ellie is snooping around while Joel was showering and finds a gun. She puts it in her backpack. That is Chekhov's gun if I've ever seen one. The two get into the pickup and head out. Ellie finds a mixtape in the glove compartment and puts it in. It is the song that Bill played for Frank all those years ago, a long, long time. And then we get a shot from Bill and Frank's room looking out from the window, very reminiscent from the starting menu of the games. And that is the end of the episode. So what'd you think of it? Leave it down in the comments below. And if you want more Last of Us content, please subscribe and like the video. Also check out the Twitter link in the description below and as always, have an awesome day.